Grace, mercy, and peace to you this morning. Um, welcome to our Thursday morning Bible study on John, uh, the book of John. <clears throat> um, I'd like to begin our, our, our Bible study for today on the book of John with a little prayer, <clears throat> our call out to grace. Um, so if you could pray with me. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Um, so welcome again to uh, our, our Gospel of John class. Um, uh, last week, <clears throat> Pastor Andrew gave us a, a good introduction to the Gospel of John and, and got us through the first 28, um, 28 uh, verses of the first chapter. Um, and then, as I believe Pastor mentioned last week, this is not a, a synoptic Gospel um, as Matthew and uh, Mark and Luke are. Um, uh, that is synoptic being they're very, very similar. Um, John is a little bit different of a book than the other three gospels. Um, this book stands out and is, is just a bit different. Um, but John is somewhat, um, similar to Mark's gospel, at least, um, as it's beginning with John the Baptist, um, preparing a way for Jesus birth, uh, or, or Jesus, um, um, where as it, Matthew and Luke both start off their books with Jesus' birth. So Mark and John are more, let's just get on with it. Matthew and, and Luke start off with the, um, with the birth of Jesus Christ and, um, you know, the things that happened in his childhood. <clears throat> but John starts off with, uh, with Jesus' interaction in the beginning of creation and then moves immediately um, uh, with Jesus interaction to John the Baptist. So, yeah, so last week's reading left off with, um, with the testimony of John the Baptist, um, in his preparation for the coming Lord. And now we step back into the story of the following scene in which the Lord now comes. Um, so let's get into it. And, um, let me share my screen with you so we can have a Bible. <clears throat> okay. All right. So you should be able to see the um, um, the reading here of uh, John. We have an introduction. Um, let's go down. We're going to start with verse 29 as Pastor Andrew finished up on 28 last week. There we go. All right. So behold the Lamb of God. Um, we're going to first read 29 through uh, 34 and stop a little bit and kind of discuss what uh, what's going on. So um, here we go. John chapter 1, verses 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with the water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Um, so just really quick, something that I kind of, um, that stuck out to me in the, at, at the end of that reading was um, he whom, you know, the last verse there, he whom, on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, 
This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen um, and have borne witness to this being the Son of God. So going backwards, but he who sent me, bap- uh, uh, sent me to baptize with water said to me that I am sending one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Um, so, um, so that's kind of, I guess, the imagery that we have in church today is there's a, there's a baptism that happens all the time in our church, with usually with infants in our Lutheran church, where we have uh, these kids that have water being poured on their heads. Typically, it'll happen three times. They'll uh, pour, uh, saying, I baptize you with the Father, baptize you in the name of the Son, baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. And, um, and we're baptizing with water there, but there's water that is also connected with the Word. There's an element, an earthly element, connected with the Holy Word. Um, and so it isn't us who are baptizing. Uh, it's not really... Um, us choosing to be baptized it's christ purely the only one who's doing the 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 true work in that baptism which is providing the holy spirit Uh, so just something real quick that um that caught my eye at the end of that Um, and I, i actually preached on this passage way back in january um if you remember and i tried to explain the the image of what was happening in this text um and, and the image that I gave that I, I got um, was from a friend of mine. Um, the image that I used in my sermon was a friend of mine um, in which he explained that there's a, a beautiful spotless white lamb. So that this, this reading here shows a beautiful white um, spotless lamb coming down the hill um, uh, to some water that is being used by these dirty, disgusting, sinful sinners um, and they're washing themselves, washing all the dirt off of them and into the water. And so the water is now all murky and dirty. You can imagine that the, just the dirty water that would be sitting there because all these sinners are washing themselves in it. Um, so then we have the beautiful clean lamb then, who comes and enters this, this water, this dirty, murky water in his beautiful um, clean wool soaks up all the dirt and that disgusting dirt that was inside the water um, and goes back up the hill and he goes back up the hill in order to be put to death because he holds the world's sins and dirt on him his wool has now soaked up all the world's sins and dirt and now he has to be put to death so this is kind of the image in the, in the passage here with the Lamb of God. Uh, so yeah, behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Um, lambs are very common in both um, the Old and the New Testament. Um, old New Testament times, we have lambs mainly used as sacrifice, even during the time of Abraham. Um, we, we know during the, ec- that the Exodus that God commanded his people obviously to take one lamb per household. Do you remember that? Um, in our uh, Bible study, in our last Bible study in Exodus, there's to be one lamb per household to take and sacrifice and use its blood to paint the doorposts on, uh, on all the households in order that the Lord may pass over those households and, um, and uh, um, grant them mercy. Um, as the spirit, as God took the firstborns of all those who did not do such things. Um, so, yeah. And so, so from them, then on, there was this festival of Passover, obviously because the Lord passed over Israel um, out of mercy to bring them out of Egypt, um, to rescue them from slavery. Um, so on, on this festival every year, on, on Passover every year, the Israelites would sacrifice a lamb and they'd eat it um, similar to our lamb of God. Um, you know, here, our lamb of God, we uh, eat um, typically every other Sunday here, but a lot of churches will do every Sunday during communion or eating that sacrifice that was made for us. So here Jesus is referred to as the lamb of God. And usually there was a lamb um, of men a lamb given by men, uh, by men to 
um, receive a forgiveness. But now we have the Lamb of God. So we go from Lamb of men to Lamb of God, a Lamb given from God to his people, a Lamb that is suitable for what it will be um, sacrificed for, um, that being the sins of the entire world. Um, so many people hear Lamb of God and think of um, a friendly, cuddly animal. Um, but the, con the connotation to the word lamb at that time um, in our text would, would be something you, not cuddly and sweet and you'd want it as a pet. Something, it would be something more of you had to kill on behalf of your sins, on behalf of what you've done wrong. Um, so John does not call Jesus the lamb of God to give us the impression that he um, uh, is a majestic being who wants to be your pet or your friend. No, he calls him this because Jesus' purpose here is to do what many lambs' purposes were, to die. He was to die. Um, but this lamb's death was not for payment of one household, like in, our, in the Passover in Exodus. No, this lamb, his death pays for all all the sins of the entire world. Um, so we have a, a shift in mood here. We hear about lambs all the time in the Old Testament. Now we go to the New Testament. We read John here, and, uh, uh, and then John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. Um, not any old lamb that is provided by men for a sacrifice of one single household. No, this is the Lamb of God, a lamb that was provided by God for the sins of the entire world. So, um, definitely a cool, um, <clears throat> cool verse here. Um, explains everything about Jesus and who he is and what, it, what his purpose is here uh, for. Um, like I said, it's not here to be your pet and to be all cuddly and cute. No, he came to die. He came to die for you, um, which is amazing because we are just lowly creatures. and. The Lamb of God, one provided by God, who is God, uh, came and died for you to be saved uh, so that you don't have to suffer. Um, you, you get eternal life. And your friends who believe and your family who believes, you know that they get eternal life. And you'll be all um, joined together once again one day. Uh, and that's what, well, that's what the Lamb does. That's what the Lamb came to do. So... Um, let's uh, let's move on um, to let's go to John um, one do thirty five. We'll do that next one. Jesus calls the first disciples. John thirty five to forty two uh, <clears throat> says the next day again. John was standing with two of his disciples, that be, being John the Baptist. Uh, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, "Behold." the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus then turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So uh, in this, so, so, so something to point out here in this um, little passage is that the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, like I said before, they're not, like, they're not similar to John very much. Um, uh, but uh, here the Synoptic Gospels would have Jesus' temptation immediately following his baptism, whereas John in our passage here um, the book, the book of John, immediately follows the scene with the calling of his disciples. So, where the other books will just go straight to a temptation, um, uh, 
with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John goes straight to let's call the disciples and let's just let's just push that out. Let's not add that um, that story of Jesus going into temptation and going into the desert. Let's just forget about that. Let's skip over it, kind of thing. Um, and I'm very curious of why he does this um, and leaves many other stories out of the uh, um, that you know that the other gospels don't. Um, which gives, you know, the explanation of why they're called the Synoptic Gospels. They're all very similar. They all have a very similar story where John um, kind of skips around things. Um, but uh, it is important to note when this question, you know, with, with this question of, you know, why is John so much different than, uh, than the, the, uh, the Synoptic Gospels? Why does he choose um, choose some stories and not others? It's important to know the reason for why G, why John wrote the gospel that he wrote. Why did he write this in the first place? Um, and he states this in at the end of his book, towards the end of the book, um, in chapter twenty, verses thirty through thirty one. Um, he says, "Now Jesus, um, Jesus did so many other signs." Um, you know, let's just go, let's just go. I did. It was, uh, John 20, 31. <clears throat> John 20. Yeah, computer's a little slow. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so here it is. The purpose of this book. Let me highlight it for you. Um, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, my, my assumption with that, so the reasoning for this, for um, this book, why John wrote this book, is so that whoever reads it um, believes that by believing you may have life in his name. So my assumption for why John leaves this story out, the story of the temptation of Jesus Christ in the desert, um, the reasoning is... Uh, is probably because he didn't think that it was necessary. Uh, it wasn't necessary for us to know in order for the Holy Spirit to work faith in us. And that's what happens when faith, um, when there's faith. There's the hearing of the word, and the Holy Spirit comes into such person who hears the word, and he works faith uh, within them. And so John just decided, you know, that story is not as essential or as needed um, for the Holy Spirit to work its work. Uh, so that's kind of my, my assumption of why, why John probably left this out, along with many other uh, stories of Jesus that the Synoptic Gospels leave in. Uh, and something else that kind of sticks out, too, in, in this text is Jesus' question um, to the disciples, to these disciples. He asks, what do you seek? What do you seek? And we know the reason for this book is so that... Um, that you may believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, right? So we know the reason is that. So the question to them is also to us all as well. Do you seek all that I am through what I will do? As does, you know, does the reader, do, do you, who, who is the reader, do you seek what this story tells of me and who I am? That's what, you know, that's the question that's at hand here. Are you going to take this, the first step? Is this, um, is this what you are looking for? You probably don't know it yet, but once you read through it, faith will either happen or uh, you will, uh, you'll reject it. And that's really the two things that happen in, <laughs> in faith is um, you either, you either believe it or you don't. It could be 100% facts, and you could not believe it. 
um, just because we have that, uh, that choice to um, say no to things. So the disciples answer with, um, with uh, you know, what do you seek? Um, with the desire to stay, they, they answer it with a desire to stay wherever he stays. They say, so he says, what do you seek? They say, well, we just want to stay wherever you stay. Or they ask, where do you stay so we can stay there too? Um, and this is not a, a, a seeking of knowledge, but a seeking of, of a different life. This isn't, tell me, you know, uh, they don't say we seek where you go because they want to know where he goes. They seek where he goes because they want to go with him. This is a changed life that they're seeking. This is a different life. Um, similar to, you know, Christianity. When you, when you were a Christian, you were taking on a different life, um, a life of obedience uh, to God and his commands, a life of love for God and a relationship with him, um, and many other things. Um, for the spirit, you can go on and on. So to seek God in the Old Testament, to seek God um, was to be faithful and turn away from your old former sins. Um, so it was, a, it was a form of repentance that was always accompanied um, by forgiveness, always accompanied by forgiveness. Um, so that's something else that we have here with what do you seek? Well, in the Old Testament, seeking God was almost like a repentance. I want to follow God again. Um, when they, when they, when people weren't seeking God in the Old Testament, when they would say that, they were in, um, they would go into exile, they go to go to Babylon or whatnot. Um, but when they went to seek God, that's when they were being rescued. <clears throat> so let's also take note too on um, of how little the disciples knew at this point, um, and how much larger. Um, of a position they were in or how much larger their answer was going to be, um, you know, for, you know, example, the response with the desire to stay wherever Jesus remains, um, you know, little did they know what that meant. They little did they know that Jesus will go to the cross for persecution, just as many of Jesus disciples did many of them, uh, almost all of them, except for one, um, were per persecuted to death, um, just as their, as their rabbi Jesus did. Um, and ironically, the only disciple who uh, had not been persecuted to death was our author here, um, John. Um, he was ended up, he ended up being banished to, um, I think, Patmos, uh, uh, secluded island just because um, his persecutors just didn't know how to kill him. Uh, they tried everything. They tried burning him in oil, stoning him. He just wouldn't die. And so they decided, well, we'll just banish you to a, an island by yourself. Um, and that's where he spent the rest of his days. But Jesus also also remained, um, you know, you know again, Jesus also remained in his father's house as does his beloved disciples, uh, which all of them did. Um, and as does all who read this book and believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Um, so where Jesus remains, um, remains is with the Father in heaven. Um, and of course, we know he'll come back one day and um, bring us up there with him. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's, what the, that's really what we're desiring. That's what we're seeking, right, is to remain with our God to remain with Jesus and where he remains is with the father. And that's the goal to remain with the father and continue a relationship with him as creature and creator. Let's uh, continue on to, uh, to 4351. I think. 40, four, chapter one, verse 43 to the end. Let me go back here. Sorry, my computer's a little too slow. Come on. 
Okay, so here we are. Let me just pick that out. So we're at the end of chapter one here, 43 to the end of 51. Jesus calls Philip and Nathaniel. <clears throat> it says the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from uh, Bethsaida, or Seda, um, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Famous, famous saying. Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Behold, I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Um, something interesting that just kind of popped in my head was um, the end of verse 47. Where it says, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Um, important to you know remember, uh, God cares for his chosen people. His chosen people are chosen. He do, they, are, they don't choose God. God chose them. Um, similar to all, all of us. That's just how faith goes. God chooses you. You don't choose him. Uh, you can reject him, but you do not choose him. Um, Similar, you know, phrasing from Martin Luther. I, uh, for I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, come to know my Lord and Savior or, or believe in Him. Uh, so, yeah. So um, many have have kind of interpreted this text here um, at the end, especially they they interpret it where Jesus describes the angels, you know, the angels ascending and descending at the end on the Son of Man, um, uh, with the heavens opened as a, as a similar event to the vision Jacob had way back in the Old Testament um, in the story of Jacob's ladder. If you remember that story, you, you had the angels ascending and descending with the heavens opened and the ladder going up. And um, so many kind of connected this here to Jacob's ladder. Um, Jesus being the connection between heaven and earth um, being that ladder. So you can also get that, this feeling too of th that the disciples um, have no choice in the matter of following Jesus. Like I said, uh, we don't choose it. Uh, he chooses us. Um, it kind of seems at first like Nathaniel chose to follow Jesus. Um, almost like, you know, he, he got enough information to make a good solid decision based on facts to follow this Jesus, but in reality, um, this isn't the case. If you re really read it, it is Jesus who calls. It is Jesus who, who is calling Nathaniel here. Um, Jesus works up the curiosity and faith in Nathaniel so that he might believe. Um, yeah, so it was, uh, it was, it was Jesus who, who revealed the information that was uh, that was needed. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, sorry, something's going wrong with the computer here. Um, or is, yeah. So yes, yeah, so this is not this. Just isn't the case that we uh, we choose God. He chooses us. And it's not Nathan that's choosing Jesus and to follow Jesus. Um, it is God who's creating that curiosity. And it's Jesus who's, who's asking the questions. Um, 
It is Jesus who calls. Um, Jesus works up curiosity and faith in Nathaniel so that he might believe. Um, it was Jesus who revealed the information that was needed so that the Holy Spirit could work faith in Nathaniel. Um, so, yeah, so I mean that with all this, it's, it's not us, it's Jesus. It's Jesus, 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 the Sunday school answer. Jesus calls us, he chooses you. Um, he brings you into his righteous right hand and lifts you up and brings you to the Father to remain with him. He is the Lamb of God. He is not a Lamb of men. He is the Lamb of God, the one that is given by God to be a sacrifice for you. And he came not just to, sac to be a sacrifice, but to bring you up to heaven with him, to bring you to the Father, and to call you by name and say that you are mine. So, um, that that's uh, all I have for this week um, in our John class. Uh, next week we'll we'll dive into chapter two with the wedding at Cana. Um, I hope you enjoyed the the Bible study for today and uh, blessings on the rest of your week. <laughs>